Okay, looks like people are there, there, so let's get this started. We don't have a whole lot of time, but, uh, but if there's any questions or uh, any problems or anything, feel free to interrupt me at any time. And we'll just have to uh, try to get through it, uh, either way. So, this talk is going to be about toolchain options in 2023. In probably most people are familiar with uh, what is the current toolchain situation. In the, there's one well-known, well-documented way to build cross-compilers, and uh, that's probably what many people here have been doing for years. But there's a couple of other options that are not as widely known and uh, that might be worth investigating for new projects. So traditionally, you would be, uh, build GNU bin utils, then build a minimal GCC cross compiler, uh, only C, uh, no threading support. Then you'd build glibc and then build GCC again with all the features you need. And there's a couple of good reasons to keep doing exactly that. By far, it's the most uh, widespread, uh, most third party libraries and applications have been tested with it. Chances are, if you have problems, you can find people on IRC and forums who have done it before and can help you. And it works well and optimizes well enough. But, like I said, it's no longer the only option. Let's take a look at binutils first. That's a collection of tools that deal with object files. Uh, if you haven't used binutils directly, you've used it indirectly because your compiler co uh, calls out to it. Um, for example, whenever you're linking together object fi uh, files into a final executable that, uh, that is done uh, by binutils. And tools like object dump and so come from there. There's three major implementations of it, and there's a good chance you actually have all of them installed on your computers right now. First is GNU bin utils, that's the standard implementation that has been around forever. Then there's ELF utils, which is shipped with pretty much all the Linux distributions these days to get uh, libelf, which is one of the components that uses but it also contains uh, its own implementations of pretty much all the tools uh, provided with bin utils. And then there's LLVM bin utils, which is part of LLVM, uh, which is also included in pretty much every distribution out there, uh, if only to build Mesa with it. LF utils has pretty good implementations of the tools that it provides, but it's lacking a linker, which is uh, one of the key components you will need for when you're compiling stuff. So binutils by itself won't do it, but you can supplement it for, with binutils, LLVM, or mold. And the tools in binutils and LLVM binutils are pretty much interchangeable, use mostly the same parameters. But the tools that come with LLVM have one big advantage. All the cross compilers are built in. So even if you just have an object file and you don't even know if it was compiled for x86 or ARM or RISC-V or PowerPC or whatever, you can use LLVM object dump dash dash disassemble and it will just detect what it is and uh, give you the right output. So if you're expecting to work with uh, disassemblers and across multiple architectures, that may be a good reason to check out the bin utils parts of LLVM. Next key part is the linker. The, if you don't do anything on most machines, you, uh, most distributions, you will have the BFD linker installed by default and that will uh, do its work in the background when you call GCC or Clang or whatever. But there are a couple of alternatives. So the LLD linker, which is part of LLVM, has been pretty good at replacing GCC ever since version 10. It's currently at version 16. There's a couple of uh, compatibility problems you might see if you're using very complicated linker scripts, but other than that, uh, LLD is uh, pretty much ready to replace uh, the other implementations. And another interesting option is the mold linker, which has been started by the original developer of LLD, and it focuses on linking speed and parallelism. The, so. If you are ever concerned about your application uh, taking way too much time to link, that is an interesting option to check out. 
Another interesting part of it is that it supports both Clang LTO and GCC LTO, but uh, its linker script support is somewhat limited uh, and full support isn't planned, so if you're using any complicated linker scripts, for example, in an embedded system the, uh, where you try to include all the system boot up code and everything to write in your main binary, the uh, mult is not an option for the moment, but for the bigger systems, desktop systems, uh, servers, or uh, even big embedded systems, it can certainly be interesting these days. Next big components is the compiler. Obviously, GCC has been around forever. It still does a very, a very good job. It supports uh, C, C++, Objective-C, Fortran, Ada, Go, D, supports all the major architectures, Always supports the latest versions of languages like uh, C17, most of C20, parts of C23, and optimizes pretty well as well. The main alternative to it is Clang, which comes from the LLVM project. It also supports a couple of uh, yeah, all the interesting languages C, C, Objective C, Fortran. Mm. Frontends for other languages are available out of tree, so for example, Rust always uses LLVM as a backend, sharing a lot of code with Clang. And this, uh, Swift uses LLVM, Pony uses LLVM. And its architecture support is also pretty good. In addition to all the standard processors you, uh, you'll have come across, it can also target a couple of GPUs, WebAssembly and uh, BPF also supports the latest versions of the languages like C17, C20, C23, optimizes them well and has quite a few sanitizers that can help uh, debug your code and f find additional problems. Another interesting piece of information about it is that it's a cross-compiler by design. So while if you are using GCC, you have to build one cross-compiler for every target, uh, with Clang you have all the cross-compilers built in. So you just uh, use one compiler for, for all the platforms you might be targeting. You just say Clang-target and give it a triplet, and then it will ta target that architecture. Another advantage of the Clang compiler is that if you are looking at the compiler's code itself, Unless you've been working on GCC code for a long time already, um, it's much easier to understand Clang's code to, uh, than to get into uh, working on GCC itself. Now we've already talked about the targets. Performance is important, obviously. And performance of Clang built binaries and GCC built binaries these days is pretty much similar. There are special cases where either one will perform be, uh, better than the other one. Overall, most benchmarks show that these days Clang 16 is carrying a slight advantage over GCC 13, but in most cases it's uh, not very relevant. It's uh, within a range of uh, 2 to 5 percent. It's interesting that Clang tries to be a drop-in replacement for GCC, so it takes pretty much the same command line options. You can switch one for the other uh, without making too many changes to your make files or anything. And Clang has been around since 2012, uh, and while GCC has been around since 1987. Obviously, the age is both an advantage and a disadvantage for each. GCC has been around for a uh, longer time, which means it has, uh, has collected more bug fixes and more, uh, more experience over the long time, whereas Clang uh, has been written quite a bit later, uh, which means it uh, probably doesn't have the same amount of experience in it, but it also doesn't have to carry around craft from 1987 that has been obsolete for ages. So that's not a clear advantage of either one, but it's a notable difference. Another difference is in licensing, but, uh, GCC is GPL, K Clang is Apache 2.0. I'm not going to get into the flame wars about this. Uh, personally, I think both of those licenses have advantages, and uh, neither one should be a reason to rule out using that compiler. 
And of course, there's a good chance you will be using LLVM in some form anyway, because for example, Mesa uses it, and uh, if you have any form of UI, the, that's likely to be on your device. But uh, yeah, you probably also end up having GCC because uh, you will need libstd C++ if you're using C++, or you will need libgccs if you're using anything the, that uses the low-level compiler runtime and has uh, GCC built in. So there's a pretty good chance for whatever you're doing, you will end up building both compilers. <laughs> Compile time is also interesting. And that can be significantly shorter with Clang, especially when we are talking about C++ code. It uh, doesn't make much of a difference for things like building the kernel, which is in C, um, they're about the same, uh, they take about the same compile time there. But for example, building LLVM with GCC takes almost twice as long as building it with Clang which is because the code base is pretty much uh, heavy on C++ and the C++ components in LLVM tend to be much faster. Another interesting difference is that Clang is more modular code, so most of the functionality is contained in libraries. If you want to create a new programming language or embed a programming language into a, uh, an application as a scripting backend or whatsoever, or if you're targeting new processors and or want to target new architectures like WebAssembly or embed compiler functionality like syntax checking in an IDE you're developing or so, the, uh, there's a good chance you can use the libraries provided by Clang and it makes more sense to use those than to uh, come up with some hacks that call GCC from the command line, pass its output uh, and then decide on the, uh, warnings and stuff uh, based on that. There's one piece of good news. They are fully binary compatible. So you can uh, build a library with the GCC and then build an application that uses it with Clang or vice versa. And you can even b build one object file inside a project with one compiler, another object file with, uh, with the other compiler, link them together, and they will just work unless you're using LTO uh, where the compilers use different formats. But there's tricks with which you can do even that those tricks would involve uh, building the object files first and then converting the LTO code into uh, traditional object code and then linking the files together. If you want to mix the compilers, you have to use GCC support libraries, uh, libgcc rather than compilerrt, because Clang can make use of GCC's libraries by default, uh, but GCC, unless you are using some dash no std lib trickery and make files, uh, won't make use of the LLVM versions of the, uh, those libraries. Clang is not the only alternative compiler out there. There's also TinyCC, which is what the name implies. It's uh, probably the smallest possible implementation of a full C99 compiler. The compiler's source is smaller than four megabytes uh, compared to almost a gigabyte for uncompressed source of either GCC or LLVM. But um, obviously that has drawbacks like not implementing all the optimizations. If you care about the quality of the binary uh, that's being produced, chances are you want to use the, uh, Clang or GCC. And TinyCC has other uses, like uh, if you want to embed it into uh, your own application for as a scripting backend or so, it makes sense to the, uh, not make your application too big, especially if you're on an embedded device. So TinyCC might be a good option for that. And in some cases, it might even be sufficient as the, the uh, systems only compiler. <laughs> then there's the topic of BSPs. Many board support packages uh, come uh, with the compiler but the situation there is really not what it should be in most cases. Mostly what you will find is uh, some outdated fork of the, an outdated version of GCC or Clang. And usually in the time that has passed since uh, those compilers were forked for, uh, from their upstream projects, the upstream projects have added much better support for the hardware in question uh, than the, 
whatever the BSP maker added. So unless you're working on a very special device which is not supported by upstream compilers, it's usually good advice to ignore the BSP and just build your own uh, Clang or GCC and use that. Especially if you're making use of newer language features, uh, the older BSP compilers tend to be far behind uh, if you're looking into stuff like using C++23 or so. Sometimes that means you have to add a couple of kernel patches to support newer tool chains because the, unfortunately, again, many BSPs include an ancient kernel. And, yeah, the proper fix is obviously to uh, yeah, upstream the uh, changes to the kernel to mainline, uh, use a newer mainline kernel, but um, where you can't do that because there's the, thousands of patches uh, needed to make your hardware work. The, um, you can usually find patches to, uh, to make the kernel work uh, inside the kernel repository, so usually just backporting a patch or two from uh, mainline kernels to whatever four point something kernel you might have in the BSP the, uh, will make it work with the current compilers you've been building. There's a bit of a special case for the extensor architecture. The Clang the, uh, doesn't have support for, for it in upstream yet. It's supported by the LLVM libraries in version 16, uh, but not yet by the Clang frontends. And there actually is a vendor version that works well. And of course, uh, while working on libAPU, which is a library for uh, talking to all the APUs, uh, we have uh, created a little fork of that that's rebased to LLVM 1604, giving the latest LLVMs uh, with all the extensor patches. And we really hope both of those versions can go away uh, with LLVM 17 uh, merging all the remaining extensor patches. Now, like I've already mentioned quickly, uh, Clang and GCC are similar in performance across all the architectures I've looked at, which is ARC64, RISC-564, and x86-64. But it doesn't mean you will never run into any surprises. For example, if you run lo uh, loop unroll from the Adobe C++ benchmarks on ARC64, and you make it work on Int32T, GCC build version will take uh, 208 seconds, while the Clang build version uh, will finish in 14 seconds. But now, if you are saying, ha, GCC sucks, Clang is so much better, you don't even have to switch benchmark suites. You just uh, run a different file uh, from the same benchmark on x86, and you uh, get GCC uh, outperforming Clang on that. So, what are the conclusions for compilers? GCC and Clang are both good. There's no clear winner. And both have been used to compile full systems, including the kernel these days. Most Linux distributions are built with mostly with GCC, with the notable exceptions of Open Mandriva and Android, which are built with Clang. BSDs are mostly built with Clang. Quite a few built from source distributions offer both choices. If you're using Yocto, uh, it uses GCC by default, but you can pull in the meta Clang layer to get Clang support, and uh, that will work pretty well as, to, uh, as well. So Clang makes it easier, and unless you are very much into GCC's code base uh, already, to add new architectures, new languages, use it as a library. If you are planning to work on the compiler itself, probably Clang is the way to go. If you are using glibc, at the moment you still need GCC to build it. Clang support for glibc is still in progress. And if you don't need any of the extras offered by Clang and you want to go with just one compiler, that's a good reason to use GCC for the, that particular system. And of course, the overall conclusion is multiple compilers are good. If you can, try to build your code with multiple compilers. You can find out um, which compiler works best for your particular code you, uh, you are uh, developing. 
you won't run into a nasty surprise as like the compiler being 20 times slower than it should be uh, just because you didn't try anything else. And also it will help you find bugs because different compilers warn about different problems. I found a construct like this in a Bluetooth driver the, where they actually assumed passing a character array to, um, and using Zysof on it would tell the size of the array but it obviously returns the uh, pointer size of the uh, target system because it's being passed around as a pointer. And up until very recently, only Clang would warn about this. A similar warning has been added to GCC lately, and I'm sure there are other situations in which GCC will warn about something that uh, Clang silently swallows. So it is always useful to run your code uh, through multiple compilers and see what they have to say. Next component of a tool chain is a libc. The default option that pretty much everyone is using all the time is glibc. It's the most uh, widespread, uh, most complete, most standards compliant thing there is. It's very well tested. It has very complete architecture support. But its code is not very readable. It needs GCC to be compiled. So if you are opting for a Clang based system, the, that may be a reason against using glibc. It's not very optimized for small systems. It's rather big, roughly four megabytes for the uh, LDSO and libc, libm. So especially if you're targeting a lower end system, you might want to look at some alternatives. One of those is muzzle. It's also complete, fast, relatively small, 785K compared to glibc's four megabytes. It's designed for new, uh, newer versions of the languages uh, C11 plus and POSIX uh, 2008. It also implements many glibc extensions, Linux extensions, BSD extensions. So you probably won't run into m uh, many problems at compile time that, uh, while you're porting to it. Chances are it will just work. It also has really good architecture support. The code is quite a bit more readable. It has been around since uh, 2011, which is once again the uh, same situation as with G uh, GCC and Clang. One has been around longer and can probably be considered a bit more mature. The other is newer and therefore doesn't carry around all the craft. So that's an advantage and a disadvantage at the uh, same time. One thing people frequently point out, uh, uh, speaking against muscle, is that uh, systemd pretends it needs glibc. So you can think that if, if you want to use systemd on a system, you have to use glibc, but it's not actually true. If you uh, edit the make files a bit and uh, patch uh, two or three lines of code, at least the basic components of systemd will work perfectly with muscle. It's possible that there's some components that won't, but at least I haven't run across any that won't so far. Another option is UCLibCNG, which is a project that has been around for a long time, uh, but it uh, has also stopped a couple of times and then restarted. One of the most interesting features of this one is that it's uh, possible to strip it down easily. You have a configuration system that is uh, similar to the kernels where you can just uh, leave out parts of the libc uh, that are part of the standard but that you won't need for your particular embedded system. Like you can leave out libm or you can leave out the stdio stack or stuff like that if you don't need it. And it supports many processor types including the ones that don't have MMUs. So if you are targeting the very low end that certainly worth a look as well. Then we have KLibc, which is originally lib uh, written for early boot up process. Some distributions like the Debian use it in initRAMFS. It only provides its upside of libc functions. It's optimized for size of a performance. It uh, tries to make direct use of kernel structures so it doesn't have to convert types so for example, uh, in other libcs, the uh, kernel might have a different idea of, uh, of what's in the struct stat than the libc. 
in KLIPC, the, the kernel structures are used. Because of that, it's extremely small. You can get the full LIPC in 75 kilobytes. It's probably not powerful enough as a real world LIPC, but it might be an option for some embedded systems. Mm. One problem is that it uses GPL kernel headers, and the resulting license situation is not 100% clear. Like, when the, uh, does that make it a derived work, and you uh, have to uh, put everything that uses it under the GPL, and uh, when doesn't it really affect it because it's uh, standard interfaces? But of course, if you're building a system that is fully GPL anyway, that doesn't really matter. One thing that is coming up, not yet fully finished, but, but looking interesting, is the LLVM libc. It's in early stages, some code is there, you can look at it in the LLVM Git repositories. It's potentially interesting because it has been designed from scratch to work with sanitizers and fast testing. Targets only C17 and up, so it doesn't carry around any of the ancient craft uh, that you might want to get rid of. Design goal is to use source-based implementations uh, whenever possible, instead of using assembly like the, um, many of the other libcs. That is actually a design goal because it's uh, being written by compiler developers. So the idea there is to fix the compiler to generate the, the code that you would otherwise handcraft. While it is not yet re ready, the LLVM project has a track record of delivering good toolchain options for both in binutils and the compilers. So it's certainly worth mentioning already. But if you are planning to get something out this year, the, uh, it's probably not worth a look. Another option there is Bionic, which is what Android uses. It's originally based on a BSD libc. Currently supports ARM and x86, but, uh, both in 32 and 64 bit variants. I know that Risk V support is underway. It's rather well optimized because of the vendor support Android is getting. In its early stages, it used to be pretty much unusable for a regular Linux system because it wouldn't provide System 5 uh, shared memory and stuff that you would need to get an x11 stack. But these days, it has pretty much caught up on that. But at the same time, uh, it added more and more Androidisms that are not used outside of Android, like Apex and system properties, and the build system is totally tied to the Android tree. So even the, uh, just building it outside of the Android tree to, uh, to make use of it in any different context is a bit of a challenge. But of course, an advantage of using Bionic, uh, even if you are not uh, on Android, is that closed drivers written for Android uh, could be used in any different Linux system that uses Bionic without having to go through stuff like libpybris. So if you are trying to build anything that is in any way a Linux Android uh, hybrid system, Bionic might just be the way to go. There's a few other options that should be mentioned. Newlib uh, is a pretty much complete implementation for, uh, of a C library, for, uh, mostly for embedded devices. It only supports static linking, so as soon as we are talking about bigger devices, it becomes less interesting. But it is uh, certainly useful in the low-end embedded world, and it's used by most Zephyr builds today. Zephyr is currently transitioning to PicoLibc, which is a fork of Newlib and also of the AVRLibc, where it took uh, mostly the STDIO bits. And it uh, frequently incorporates changes from new, uh, Newlib, so it's probably a better option than Newlib, because it gives you Newlib uh, plus all sorts of, uh, of extensions and uh, better build systems. Uh, thread local storage and stuff like that. Then there's diet libc, which is really optimized for small size and static linking, but it supports dynamic linking, even though it's not really me meant for it. It's not very actively maintained, and it's under the GPL license, not LGPL. So you might have a license problem there if you are uh, building any components that aren't GPL. 
And of course, lastly, there's the option to take a BSD libc and port it to Linux, which has been done, for example, by Bionic initially. So, conclusions. There are many interesting options. Mm. Again, there's no clear winner for every situation. My advice is if you need maximum compatibility with other systems, go with glibc because uh, that's what everyone in the desktop and server world and many embedded devices uses. If you need something that is full-fledged but smaller, more memory efficient, muzzle. If you just need a subset, and you, uh, you need the possibility to uh, st uh, strip out features of the libc that you don't need, try your CLibCNG. And if you want to experiment with Android features on an embedded device or so, Bionic might just be worth looking into. Next thing is C++ support. There's primarily two uh, contenders for the STL library. One is libstdc++, which is part of GCC, used by pretty much all the Linux distributions, even those that use Clang as their primary compiler. Android is probably the only major exception that, uh, that uses uh, libc++ from LLVM instead. And uh, if you expect the stuff to just compile the, without having to add missing includes or anything, the, uh, there's a good chance you just want to use libstdc++. The main other option is libc++ for, uh, from LLVM. It's newer and smaller than libstdc++, carries le uh, less craft to support ancient code. Many benchmarks show it to perform better, but uh, not all. That's the same situation as with GCC and Clang. They are similar in performance. You can craft a benchmark that will show one being much superior to the other. You can craft another benchmark that shows the opposite. One problem is you can't mix those. So for example, if you build Qt against libc++ and then you get a third party binary that uses Qt, but their Qt has been built with libstdc++, that is going to work, uh, clash because they use many of the same symbols, but they are not fully binary compatible. So try to pick one of the libcs. There's one context in which that's uh, different. A lot of third party applications like Chromium, if you use the pre-built binaries, they will be used, with, uh, they will be built with libc++. But uh, those projects have made sure that uh, they are not being mixed with uh, C++ libraries that have been built against libstd C++, which is one of the reasons why, for example, Chromium binaries usually include a load of shared libraries that are just duplicated from the system. There's also uclibc++, which is well, an interesting option in uh, concept. It was an attempt to write an STL implementation that goes along with uclibc, so like with uclibcng, it had all the features uh, to strip out stuff you don't need, but it hasn't been uh, maintained since 2016. So if you need some of the features like being able to rip out parts of the STL that you don't need, you may want to f uh, f revive the project. But if you are not prepared to revive the project, it's not seeing any upstream maintenance to, uh, today. And uh, it's uh, not worth using unless you spend significant time on it. There's a few more implementations uh, like STL port and Apache libstdc++, but uh, they have been unsupported since 2008. One thing that is possibly worth a look, especially if you are uh, looking into working on the STL itself, is the MSVC STL that has been opened up under the Apache license recently, but it has not yet been ported to Linux and the project has no intention of doing so. But if you're interested in looking at how some platform independent stuff works, it might be another interesting place to look at, copy some code for, uh, from and maybe merge into libc++ or libstdc++. Conclusions, essentially, there's two options uh, that are generally useful. If binary compatibility with other Linux distributions is a concern, 
You certainly want to use libstdc++ because that's what everyone uses. And if you use Clang and you care about performance and memory efficiency and not so much about compatibility, the libc++ is probably the one to try. Lastly, the uh, debuggers are a component of tool chains. GDB has been around for a long time, is still being maintained actively. And as usual, the LLVM has come up with an alternative, which is LLDB. Both do pretty much the same job and both do it well. LLDB provides many command aliases for compatibility, but the, is not fully compatible. And its native syntax tends to be cleaner. It's been designed 20 years later, but it's also more verbose. So if you like uh, typing one data commands, GDB is still the one to learn. LLDB has an edge in C++ support and can evaluate expressions in the LLVM JIT. So if you don't know how to use any of the debuggers yet, the LLDB uh, is probably the interesting one to learn, but if you're already using GDB, there's no really compelling reason to switch. Now, that's all, and we have uh, one minute left. So, if you have any questions or feedback, let me now know. Uh, know. Let me know now, or uh, contact me there. And if you have any bags of cash for me, just uh, throw them at me, but not where the tax office can see them. 